day, folks. In this video, we're going to be talking about cyclic voltammetry. If you are new to the subject or you're learning about it for the first time in school, this video is for you. Cyclic voltammetry, or CV for short, is one of, if not the most popular technique used in electrochemistry. And in this video, we hope to make understanding cyclic voltammetry as easy as possible. This video is broken up into several sections. First, we're going to discuss what is cyclic voltammetry, what is the technique and the parameters around the technique. We will then discuss how cyclic voltammetry is used or applied to a three electrode system, specifically with a focus on understanding what is physically happening in our system, what electrochemical phenomenon are occurring and how those electrochemical phenomenon manifest themselves in the data, how they manifest themselves in the cyclic voltammogram. Timestamps are in the description below. And lastly, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So what is cyclic voltammetry? Cyclic voltammetry is an electroanalytical chemistry technique where a potentiostat applies a triangular potential waveform to an electrochemical system, and we measure the resulting current. The triangular potential waveform is made up of these potential sweeps. We are sweeping the potential linearly as a function of time. The measured current is also measured as a function of time. But we end up plotting the current as a function of the applied potential. So we have current on the y-axis and potential on the x-axis. And this gives us a cyclic voltammogram. The triangular potential waveform has several parameters. It has an initial potential, which is the start of our experiment. It starts the point where we sweep the potential. We then sweep it to the switching potential, which defines the end of the first segment of our triangular potential waveform. And then we have the final potential, which then defines the second segment of our linear sweep, completing the triangular waveform, where we have one cycle in a cyclic voltammetry experiment. And a cyclic voltammetry experiment may consist of one or multiple cycles. The initial potential, switching potential, final potential, and number of segments can all be adjusted depending on our electrochemical system. In fact, there's a wide variety of different potential waveforms that can be created just based on adjusting these parameters. The classical triangular potential waveform isn't strictly the only waveform used in cyclic voltammetry. For purposes of this video, we will be sticking with the classical triangular potential waveform. That being said, a cyclic voltammetry experiment must consist of at least two segments. If it only consisted of one segment, it would be referred to as linear sweep voltammetry. The final parameter that we can adjust in a cyclic voltammetry experiment is the slope of the linear sweep. This is referred to as the sweep rate or the scan rate, and it is a measure of how fast we can sweep the potential as a function of time. So that's the technique in a nutshell, but that doesn't give us a very good understanding of how the technique works. Let's apply cyclic voltammetry to a relatively standard three electrode electrochemical system, where we have a glassy carbon working electrode, a platinum wire counter electrode, and a silver-silver chloride reference electrode. All three electrodes are submerged into an aqueous electrolyte solution, the electrolyte being some kind of salt that is dissolved in the solution to maintain electrical conductivity, and we add an analyte, a redox active molecule. In this case, we'll use ferrous cyanide. Lastly, all three electrodes are connected to a potentiostat. When we apply our triangular potential waveform, we are sweeping the potential of the working electrode with respect to the reference electrode. If you're interested in understanding how a potential stat works, we have a video, and I have a card in the upper right hand corner, but I also have a link to it in the description below. The last section in particular describes what the potential stat is doing in a three electrode system, and that'll help you understand what actually is happening when we sweep the potential of the working electrode with respect to the reference electrode. As we sweep the potential, there are several things that are happening at the working electrode surface. For example, if we apply a positive bias to the working electrode surface, we attract these negatively charged anions towards the surface. Remember that our dissolved electrolyte 
is a salt that's made up of positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. Sometimes this electrolyte is referred to as a supporting electrolyte, and the anions and cations that make up the electrolyte are inert, which means that they will not react and the charge will not be neutralized by the charge at the working electrode surface. So our positively biased working electrode attracts the negatively charged anions towards the electrode surface, where the negatively charged anions will make contact with the working electrode surface. And this layer of negatively charged anions forms a plane at the working electrode, which is referred to as the inner Helmholtz plane. Well, this layer of negatively charged anions attracts the positively charged solvated cations in solution. These cations are solvated, they are surrounded by water molecules or solvent molecules. These solvated cations form a loosely bound layer known as the diffuse layer, that is, away from the inner Helmholtz plane into the bulk solution, away from the working electrode. The layer of solvated cations that is closest to the inner Helmholtz plane is referred to as the outer Helmholtz plane. Our charged electrode surface, the inner Helmholtz plane, the outer Helmholtz plane, the diffuse layer, all make up what is generally referred to as the electrical double layer region. The electrical double layer is a fairly complex topic in electrochemistry, and we paint a very simplistic picture of it. We actually recommend that you take a look at a standard electrochemistry textbook, such as Electrochemical Methods, Fundamentals, and Applications by Alan Bard and Larry Faulkner. Additionally, the Wikipedia for the electrical double layer is quite helpful, and I have a link to it in the description below. The important thing about the electrical double layer is that the orientation of solvent molecules, anions, cations, our supporting electrolyte, the orientation of these molecules is different than that of the bulk solution, and that the behavior of the electrical double layer is that of a capacitor. Recall from physics that a capacitor consists of two oppositely charged parallel plates with a dielectric in between them that prevents the charges of these two plates from combining and being neutralized. So, in our electrical double layer, we have a charged electrode surface, and we have a layer of adsorbed anions. And the amazing thing is that these two layers of charged species are so close to each other, and yet their charge is not neutralized. The charge on the anions and the positively charged electrode surface are not neutralized. If we were to take a cyclic voltammogram of just the supporting electrolyte without any redox active molecule, so no ferrous cyanide, we would get a cyclic voltammogram that looks like a rectangle that's lying down horizontally. The height of the rectangle represents the charging current of our electrochemical double layer, and it is equal to the capacitance times the scan rate. So this blank cyclic voltammogram can actually teach us quite a bit about the capacitance of the electrochemical double layer. Now, our cyclic voltammogram gets much more interesting when we add our redox active molecule, ferrous cyanide, to our electrolyte solution. As we sweep the potential, the potential will become sufficiently positive that the ferrous cyanide will undergo an electron transfer with the electrode surface. Specifically, ferrous cyanide will oxidize or lose an electron to the electrode surface. Ferrous cyanide becomes ferrous cyanide. Whenever there is an electron transfer with the electrode surface, current will flow in our electrochemical cell. This current is referred to as Faradaic current, named in honor and memory of famous electrochemist Michael Faraday. This is in contrast to the current mentioned earlier associated with double layer charging. This charging current is referred to as non-Faradaic current because there is no electron transfer occurring at the electrode surface. During a cyclic voltammetry experiment, the potentiostat will measure the total current of the electrochemical system. This includes both the Faradaic and non-Faradaic current. So, if the double layer charging and the oxidation of ferrous cyanide are occurring at the same time, both will contribute to the current response. As we sweep the potential, 
we will see this increase in current associated with the oxidation of ferrocyanide to ferricyanide. The current will reach a peak and then the current will begin to decay. The shape of this curve, the shape, the decay of the current is due to diffusion. Diffusion is the random motion of molecules. It is the mode of mass transport or the way that a ferrocyanide molecule moves around in solution. For an electron transfer to occur, a ferrocyanide molecule must be sufficiently close to the electrode surface. Well, that's pretty easy if you're a ferrocyanide molecule already close to the electrode surface. If you're farther away from the electrode, it takes longer for you to diffuse towards the electrode. And that is what we observe in the cyclobaltamogram. We observe a peak current, which is associated with the maximum number of ferrocyanide molecules oxidizing per second. Well, eventually we start to deplete the ferrocyanide molecules near the electrode surface, and we mostly have ferricyanide near the electrode. It now takes longer for a ferrocyanide molecule to diffuse towards the electrode and oxidize. So we see a decay in the current. We have fewer ferrocyanide molecules oxidizing per second. And we observe this in the cyclic voltammogram as the current decay. As we continue to sweep the potential, we reach the switching potential and we start to make our way back sweeping backwards negatively. At this point, most of the electrode surface is ferricyanide, the oxidized form of ferrocyanide. As we sweep the potential backwards, the potential is still sufficiently positive that it is continuing to oxidize ferrocyanide to ferricyanide. However, at a certain point, the potential will become sufficiently negative that we will begin to reduce, which is where the electrode will donate or give an electron to the ferricyanide molecule and convert it back to ferrocyanide. So we see a peak current associated with the reduction of ferricyanide to ferrocyanide. But as that layer gets depleted, we start to see this increase in current again, and we then complete our cyclopaltamogram. So the forward sweep contains the oxidation of ferrocyanide to ferricyanide, and as we sweep the potential back, we get the reduction of ferricyanide back to ferrocyanide. And that is a cyclic voltammogram. There is a lot of complicated math that describes the current and potential in a cyclic voltammetry experiment. However, we find that going into the math doesn't really help you understand conceptually what is happening in your electrochemical system during the cyclic voltammetry experiment. However, if you are interested in future videos where we do go into those topics in more detail, please leave a comment below. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe. All right, I'll see you soon.